standing back here a little way so that I might take off my mask. Nobody to talk to. Father, thank you for praying. Um, it was uh, on my mind as well. And the message I have today is one of encouragement. And so I think that falls right in line with all of the things that you uh, brought forth as difficulties that people are having. So um, here's an encouraging word for you today. All right. So um, we're going to be mostly in First Thessalonians chapter five. If you want to go there, that would be a wonderful thing. And at first glance, as you heard those scriptures read today, they might not have sounded particularly uplifting as a whole rule. You know, there was a lot of, uh, you know, bad things and punishments and such like that going to happen. Uh, but there are kernels of incredible hope in those scriptures. And I want to try and bring those out to you today some. Okay. But well, first of all, we're going to start with a... Um, a phrase, a phrase that's common in language and um, you, you've heard and you've said probably many times before as well, too. And that is, don't lose your head over it. Okay, you've heard that phrase before. People say, don't lose your head over it. It's a slang phrase that came into English language a long time ago. And, you know, it's kind of been shortened over the years. And now it just says, don't lose it. I'm going to lose it, you know. Um, man, I just lost it when he picked up my cheeseburger and started eating it. So, you know, things like that. Okay. Now, <laughs> the whole thing you think, well, uh, I lost it means that you're going to lose your temper. But it really came from this saying of don't lose your head over it, which in turn also, as far as I could tell, came from 19th century France, which you might be able to figure out was the time of the guillotine when it was uh, particularly active, and it was taken literally back then. But now we kind of use it as a different way of almost losing your mind, right? I lost my head. I don't know what I was thinking. But it relates to our scriptures today, and specifically to the First Thessalonian passage, and so that's what I'm going to tie it to here in a minute. And it's this passage in First Thessalonians that caught my fancy, shall we say, which in other words is the Lord showed me to go to this scripture. <laughs> and so that's where I went because there's some cool stuff in there. Okay. So we're going to spend some time in chapter five. And first of all, beginning around verse six, it says, I'm actually reading out of a real Bible to you today. Um, <laughs> and um, let me see if that's right. Wrong. So that's the wrong chapter. Let's go to chapter five. Yeah, that sounds better. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith, hope, and love as a breastplate. So you heard that. Um, and uh, it says, way back at the beginning there, and in this version, it doesn't say it, but... Um, be sober. This is one way that it's translated. It might be in your King James or your New King James version. Sober. Now we know and we understand sober usually particularly means the opposite of drunk, right? But it really means keep your head. Keep your head in all situations, okay? That's what Paul is telling us there. And that's what the translation means. really should be here. And it's also the word, same word is used in 2 Timothy uh, 4, verse 5, where he's telling Timothy to be sober, keep his head in all situations. In other words, to keep calm or to be collected in the spirit. Maybe that's a good word. Be collected in what spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit, of course. So um, if we move on to verse 7, again, for those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Keeping on verse 10, 
he died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. And then as we keep on, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Ah, now that's a wonderful word, okay? You know, the translation back there for awake or asleep, and it says, you know, whether you're awake or asleep. Well, the um, New Living Translation, which sometimes I look at, says alive or dead, but it's wrong. Right? <laughs> it's the only one that translates it that, that way. Every, every other scripture says awake or asleep. So what does that mean, right? Um, well, does that mean we have to stay awake all the time? Okay. No, it doesn't. Uh, we are in Christ. And therefore, it means you don't have to sit up all night waiting for him. Okay. So when he comes again, if you're asleep at night, whether you're slumbering in your bed and having dreams, if he comes again, he's going to wake you up, okay? <laughs> don't worry about it. You don't have to stay up all night based on the scripture, all right? When he comes, he will remember you and remember to take you to him because you're in Christ. So another way to put that more importantly is whether you've kept your head or not. He's still there. He is still with you. Even if you lose your head. Even if you've lost it. Okay? And you know what? This incredible message, if we boil it down and kind of uh, take out the essence of it, what it's saying ultimately wrapped up in this nice, big, complicated Paul bow is that you are not only responsible for your faith. You are not the sole responsibility for your own faith. Now, you are partially responsible for it, you know, and you can work on your faith. You can increase it. You know, we've talked about that over the years many, many times. But ultimately, he is responsible for your faith. He is the giver of faith. He's the one who manages it. He's the one who increases it. And when you think you don't have enough, he has enough for you. And he will cover you. You see, even if you lose your head, he will still be with you and in you. That's the incredible news. Okay? Now, you heard the gospel today. It was the parable of the talents. You heard the parable of the talents many times before. And uh, in some ways, you might think that it's sort of a judgmental sort of thing. Uh, but, you know, if we get to the end in verse 29 of that passage in Matthew 25, it says, forever has been given more, or whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. That's the upside of it. The downside is whoever has what the heat will be taken away from. Whoever has not will be taken away. What he has will be taken away from him. <laughs> it's easy for me to say. You see, the parable of the talents is about faith. Using what he has given you, not for him, but through him. And he is the one who increases our faith. Okay, He is responsible for our faith. All right? Charles Spurgeon said this about the parable of talents. He said, it's not well done, thou good and brilliant servant, for perhaps the man never shone at all in the eyes of those who appreciate brilliance. It's not well done, thou great and distinguished servant, for it is possible he was never known beyond his native village. It says, well done, good and faithful servant. That's the tie between these two scriptures right here. Good and faithful servant. Faithful. To have faith. To be filled with faith. Full of faith. You see, the message of the parable of the talents is not about how to be wise with money. It's how to be faithful. And in this, he comes to our aid. He is the creator of faith. In fact, it's not our faith at all. It is his faith 
that we carry around with us. We entered into Jesus' life. You know that you are in Christ. And you are in his faith as well. In other words, put it this way, you have a blank check on faith. He'll write anything you want, as much as you need. Because your faith is his faith. His faith is your faith. Now that's handy to know, you know, when things don't really go your way. Like maybe elections or viruses or money or health or sickness or, you know, love or relationships. It's really nice to know that your faith is his faith in those times. And if you think that Jesus is dismayed or distraught or upset or worried or wringing his hands or pacing back and forth up in heaven or, you know, just kind of worried and going crazy about the, you know, the election results or the provision for, you know, the poor or hurricanes pounding the country or vast forest fires raging, you're wrong. <laughs> He's not worried about those things. He's got it all in his hand. He's bigger than all of those things. He's bigger than any of those problems. Those are the big ones. He's bigger than any of our problems. You see, God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Paul wrote. And I think he knew something about troubling times. He was executed after all. But Paul wrote, he died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, in other words, whether we keep our heads or not, we may live together with him. Hallelujah. That's wonderful. And then finally, what does he say next? He says, therefore, encourage one another. Build each other up, just as in fact I know you are doing. And that's a word for us today, too. You know, over the last several months, I've received a number of cards and encouraging notes from many of you and those things do exactly that. They encourage me. Thank you so much. They are very encouraging when you get something like that. Because, you know, I've been discouraged at times. At work, we're so exhausted from doing COVID tests, we say, I'm starting to promote this saying, you see, um, if COVID doesn't get you, the pandemic will. And just the stuff related to a pandemic is aggravating enough. So keep those cards and letters coming, folks. I'm not saying specifically to me necessarily, but send cards of encouragement or texts of encouragement or phone messages of encouragement or emails of encouragement to others. And especially send it to those who don't know the Lord. Send it to those people. They need it more than ever. They don't have the faith that we have. <clears throat> it means so much, the encouragement. So yesterday, um, my dear cousins, Bob and Linda, sent Amanda a package in the mail. And it, with this message, it just said, a little something for your collarbone blues. And it was very encouraging. And they're faithful believers. And they encouraged us to find new ways to encourage people. And one amazing way that you can all do, because you're in Christ, is you can pick somebody that you know, pick someone out in the world, you know, you can pick a church member too, but especially pick those who don't know the Lord, pray about them, ask God to give you a word for them, and then send them a note saying, God told me this for you. You remember how exciting it is, you know, like when the bishop comes and, you know, he's ministering and he's here and he points you out and he says, I have a word for you from the Lord. 
You know that feeling that you get right there? It's like, huh? You know, it's kind of this fear thing, but it's also like the Lord actually thought of me and I get a word from him. You know that feeling I'm talking about? It's very exciting. And then you start hearing this word and sometimes it doesn't even matter what it says. Just the fact that God is speaking to you <coughs> starts to make you break down and cry. That's the kind of thing you need to share with others. That's the kind of thing that's charismatic, that's Holy Spirit, that you can do. Because they need it so desperately. Now, it doesn't have to be some profound prophecy about, you know, you're going to live a long life or whatever. It's just a word of encouragement, okay? <laughs> just something that you like about them, maybe, a characteristic of them. Say, you know what? I like this about you. That's how we increase people's faith. That's how we encourage. That's the faith of God Almighty, which is your faith. Now, finally, did you catch that part in Zephaniah? Now, you know, I know Zephaniah doesn't sound like it's a pretty fun passage right there that you heard. <laughs> you heard all this stuff. Let's see, there was punishment, and then there were loud cries and wailing, and there was wrath, and there was darkness and distress. And finally, in the end, there was blood poured out as dust. <laughs> ah, and that doesn't sound real great, does it? But back in verse 7, Zephaniah. Chapter 1, verse 7, it says this, this one little key verse that you need. Be silent before the sovereign Lord, for the day of the Lord is near. Listen, the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated those he has invited. Wow. Wow. Do you get that? He has consecrated those he has invited. In the midst of all that wrath and distress, this is great news. Okay? Who is the sacrifice? Jesus. Who are the consecrated? We are. <laughs> all who believe, we're invited. Praise be to God. Do you see? There's good news in there. That wrath stuff is not for us. Because we're in Jesus. We are one with him. So remain sober. Yeah, well, yeah. Keep your head. Don't lose it. The British say, keep calm and carry on. You see, I know it's been hard for you. Probably in a million different ways. Everybody's struggling and going through really great difficulties because of this pandemic. And I know that you get discouraged. I know you wonder if you can make it. I know that you think your faith at times is inadequate for the task. And maybe sometimes you feel like you're a failure. And that's the way I feel sometimes. But remember this scripture from 1 Thessalonians. He died for us. <laughs> so that whether we are awake or asleep, whether we kept our head or not, we may live together with him. Living with him. Good news. So encourage other believers with these words. Encourage non-believers with these words. You can find your own way. You can word them your, the way that you know how to word them. And let other people know this. Cards and letters, if you can't do it in person. Emails and texts. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. You see, whether your faith is awake or asleep, you live with him. It is not your responsibility. You can let yourself off the hook for that. It's his. And don't guilt yourself about it. Oh, I don't have enough faith. Oh, I didn't trust God in that. You're not any more a failure than God is. He 
He's going to provide for you. Always, brothers and sisters, be encouraged. These are incredible words here. We all need each other still. The other night, Father Gerard called me. He's my accountability partner. And just talking to Father Gerard is so encouraging. Because no matter what's going on, he can find the positive in it. That's all he ever shares is the good stuff. <laughs> Makes it a little hard sometimes with an accountability partner. Because <laughs> all I want to share is the bad stuff. <laughs> but he really encouraged me. And as I said, you can do that with each other too. So rest in him right now. I want you to close your eyes and just rest in him. Rest in the knowledge that whether you are awake or asleep, you live with him. Rest in the knowledge that God is big enough. He is great enough. He is all powerful. And he loves you. Amen.